Judge, the next witness is Rory O'Connor. Very good. Now, you are Rory O'Connor, a one-time High King of Ireland, isn't that the case? I am, and I remain High King, at least of that piece of Ireland remaining to me. By virtue of the Treaty of Windsor, legally concluded between myself and Henry King of the English in 1175, I am High King of a good portion of Ireland, in fact. And what tribute is paid from there to Henry is paid through me. Before that, I was High King of all Ireland, like my father Turlock before me. I succeeded him as King of Connacht first in 1156, and then in 1166, <coughs> I reclaimed the High Kingship which my father had lost with the help of my great ally, Tiernan O'Rourke, King of Breffney. That same year, we marched against Dermot McMurray, who had made the mistake of supporting the wrong candidate for the High Kingship, overthrew him, and divided up his kingdom. Dermot fled overseas, and the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> Thank you. You might answer any questions my friends have for you. Yes, Mr. Harmon. Thank you, Judge. Uh, well, first, O'Connor, we'd like to acknowledge with thanks your presence uh, here today. I think it speaks volumes that the High King himself is here, but the principal witness, a tributary king, is not. For the benefit of, uh, of the court and for everybody present, could you explain to us uh, something of the nature of Gaelic kinship? There are many kings in Ireland but only one High King. Over the last few hundred years, the various provinces have been striving with one another for supremacy. And it is the most powerful of these provincial kings who becomes the High King. Some would have it that there is a dynasty who have particular claim to High Kingship. The, we nail, but since we do not accept that claim, it remains no more than that, a claim. And we can all make claims. So there is no dynasty, and nor is, this, nor is there this practice of primogeniture, which you find elsewhere, this bizarre idea that the eldest son will always inherit, even if he is an idiot or blemished in some way. Our law provides that the king must be without blemish. You can't have a blind king, can you? Who would follow him? Would you follow him? And your relationship with Dermot McMurray, how would you describe that? We've always tried to deal fairly with McMurray. We've been allies in the past, but of late his ambition has got the better of him. That said, we have shown forbearance and patience with him and gave him every opportunity to repent of his ways. Even after he brought in the foreigners, my house was open to him and we would have welcomed him back as a fellow king. Thank you very much. Would you please answer any questions my friends may have? Mr. O'Connor. I do not recognise your form of address. You will refer to me as O'Connor or as King. Mr. O'Connor is the postman. <laughs> My apologies, O'Connor. So you claim to be King of Ireland, but what is Ireland? There is no nation. Rather, there are hundreds of little nations, all led by little kings. You're all fighting amongst yourselves all of the time. Ah, uh, yes, so we are. And you Normans have shown yourselves to be such a peaceful people. Well, we've noticed that since you arrived. Well, if you let me finish, please. <clears throat> Our point is that there is no right here in Ireland except force of arms. And you won your crown by force of arms. We took it from you by force of arms. We came here first by invitation to help a wronged king, and then in greater force, and in more importantly, in obedience to the Holy Mother Church, who asked our most gracious king, Henry, to enter this country to bring it back from a state of barbarianism. And I refer, of course, to the papal bull, Lada Bilter, which, if you are Christians, as you profess to be, you must surely accept in all humility. My lord, 
Mr. O'Higgins is giving statements again. And I have to say, we've already dealt with this position of, uh, of, of laudabilitor in John of Salisbury's uh, evidence. We deny the authenticity of, the, of laudabilitor, or in the alternative, even if it is authentic, we deny that the Pope had any right to, to uh, issue it. Very good. Uh, I've already noted that, O'Connor. Uh, do you wish to respond to the specific points put to you by Council for the Normans? We utterly reject any suggestion that there is no such thing as Ireland or an Irish national identity. We speak a common language. We have a common social and political system. We have shared legal system. We have our own literature, art and music. We have a common dress, a common religion and a common history. I might as well ask you what you are. Saxons, Normans, French, you don't even speak a common language. I'm afraid you will have to do that better than that if you want to justify your invasion of my country. No further questions, Judge. Very good. Yes, just a few questions. Um, they're not strictly relevant for the purposes of this inquiry, but they do go to your, your character. Now, Dermot McMorrow is often characterized <laughs> as being vicious, being ruthless, being a cruel man. Now, I might put it to you that you're really no angel yourself, are you? You, I think, rebelled twice against your own father, is that correct? Once in 1136, once again in 1143. And then when your father died and you succeeded him as King of Connaught in 1156, you immediately imprisoned three of your own brothers and blinded one of them simply because you saw him to be a potential rival. No angel, I say it again. Then you fought your way back into the competition for high king, <coughs> deposing a few other kings along the way, allied yourselves with the Vikings in Dublin and proclaimed yourself high king. And you say, Dermot is no angel. This is a ruthless game and a ruthless country. I make no apologies for what I am or for what I did. And as for the Vikings of Dublin, you say that as if they are still pagans. You know that every king who hopes to be high king must secure Dublin. Its wealth, its trading partners, and war fleet is essential. If you don't know that, your king, Dermot, certainly did. Um, O'Connor, with the greatest of respect, you have persecuted our client for years, denying him the very things that you took by force yourself. I have not persecuted the man. I have been, as I said, a model of moderation and forbearance. A model, a model of forbearance. Um, do you recognize this letter I have before me here? The judge should say we haven't, none of us have seen this letter. Yes. And I object to this entire line of questioning that my friend is putting, which by his own admission is of limited relevance to the issues that are before the inquiry. Well, I think it uh, uh, goes perhaps to the uh, credibility of the witness, Mr. Harmon, um, and it is an inquiry. I'll allow the letter to be introduced. If you have a copy of the letter before you, and you have a copy which I have marked, do you? I do indeed. And you might just read out that relevant section, please. Contrary to our treaty, you have invited a host of foreigners into this island, and yet as long as you kept within the bounds of Leinster, we bore it patiently. But now, ignoring your solemn oaths and having no concern for the fate of the hostage you gave us, you have broken the bounds agreed upon and arrogantly trespassed across <coughs> the borders of your own lands. That's rather well put, if I say so myself. Um, you, you might just read <coughs> the entire passage, please. In future, either restrain the excesses of your foreign bands, or we will most certainly have your son's head cut off, and we will send it to you. Not great, really, is it? Um, would you call that moderate? Would you call that reasonable? I think so. So yes, I call that a moderate and reasonable response in the circumstances. McMurrah wasn't listening to me. We had a deal, and he broke it. He needed to know that there would be consequences. Judge, I, I'd love to interrupt my uh, dear friend, Mr. O'Connor here and Mr. Persifka, but uh, this is the first we've heard of any deal between McMurrah and the yeah. former High King. This was at a time when McMurrah had a deal 
with my clients. And we insist on more information immediately. Yes, yes I'm inclined to agree, O'Connor. Uh, what sort of deal uh, did you have with Dermot McMurray? He agreed to send back his Norman mercenaries, and I agreed to recognise his rule in Leinster. Well, this is absolutely outrageous. This, this is the first we've ever heard of this judge, and I have to say, it hasn't been put before the court before now. Judge, here we go. Uh, making, making speeches again rather yes. than ask, asking questions. Oh, it's a matter of perhaps a sin committed you by yourself, Mr. Harmon, on occasion. <laughs> Uh, everybody needs to settle down, I think. I've um, sinned against than sinning. Against. This is quite a revelation, O'Connor. Uh, what response did you receive from McMurray to your letter? It just so happens that I have it here. <laughs> <clears throat> we will not desist from the enterprise we have undertaken until we have reduced Connacht to subjection, which we claim as our ancient inheritance, and until we have obtained it with it the monarchy of the whole of Ireland. King of Leinster was no longer good enough for him. He wanted to be King of Ireland. And what response did you make to that, O'Connor? I cut his son's head off, and <laughs> his grandsons, and his foster nephews. And I sent their bodies back to him. So I, I think, Judge, we've now really made our, our point. Our client has been depicted um, in the worst possible light. Um, McMorrow is being depicted as a murderer, as a pillager, as a rapist. But the High King's own testimony shows the environment in which my client had to operate. Dermot McMorrow was no worse than any other king in medieval Ireland, Judge, and we have no further questions. Thank you, O'Connor. You may step down.